Here we are. It's the Monday before Thanksgiving. I'm Ron Coddington, the editor and publisher of Military Images Magazine, coming to you live. We are going to take a couple of minutes until we uh, have folks begin to join us, and then we will get started. And uh, I'll be watching our comments on the side of our Facebook screen to see who is joining us and uh, getting ready to say hello to Mr. Andrew Harris. Michael is here. How are you doing this evening, Michael? Thank you for joining us. We're a thumbs up back at you. Uh, we are coming to you uh, live. Going to get a let, a let a couple minutes go by so everyone can join us. Uh, I see Chris is with us. Hey, Chris, how are you? Um, I'll tell you uh, quickly, um, one of our viewers said, hey, you guys don't do enough to advertise your great magazine. So here is uh, the in-your-face advertisement. Yes, we will have a Black Friday special. So when you're shopping on Friday, um, stop by Military Images. We'll be offering a subscription, a special subscription for introductory subscribers, for new subscribers. Um, while we're waiting for folks, hello, hello, Joseph, how are you? Glad you can make it. Uh, Rick, how are you doing? Doug, how are you doing, sir? Uh, a couple more, maybe another minute or so before we get started. Uh, I will also tell you another comment we had. Uh, a few people laughed about our technical issues around the paper that was uh, blowing off of the little shelf we have here. So I came up with a novel solution, uh, thicker paper. So I think we can put our technical issues behind us, at least for this episode. We'll see how the rest of it goes. Uh, so I want to start out tonight. I think we'll get going. We have a good number of folks online right now. I want to start uh, with a question asking, uh, I'm sure a bunch of you um, here this evening have had someone uh, in your family who served in World War II, perhaps a grandfather, uh, a father, maybe even a great grandfather, an uncle, someone like that. I got me thinking about my own grandfather. Uh, he liked to tell a few stories about his wartime experiences. And uh, one of his stories was about entering Germany in 1945 at the end of the war. And it occurred to me as I thought about grandpa's story, uh, other veterans that I've talked to and, and also other civil war stories that I've read and researched where the soldier or sailor will talk about something that happened uh, to them in a great battle uh, or something that happened to them towards the end of the war. And um, that got me to thinking about the first subject of tonight's conversation. It's this image right here. This is uh, Jack Grimble, who served in the Confederate States Navy. Now I want to take you back uh, to the 1880s, the 1890s, when Jack was uh, a veteran. He had been through the war. Uh, he's from Charleston, South Carolina originally. And the story he liked to tell and in fact, one that he talked about publicly, he was invited to speak on this subject, was about his experiences on the Shenandoah. And uh, those of you who are familiar with uh, the Navy, the Confederate States Navy, know that the Shenandoah was the, it's the last, it's considered the last ship uh, to surrender, uh, the last ship to be involved in any hostile actions. Um, uh, firing on a fleet uh, up in, I believe, the uh, Arctic Circle, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, uh, their war came to an end in November of 1865. Uh, the ship and the crew became something of a legend, certainly after the war, into the 1880s, the 1890s, uh, and beyond. Several books have been written about the subject, and um, Jack told his story, as I mentioned earlier. In fact, most people that knew Jack uh, heard about the story. And this is what it reminded me of my grandfather, who told that story about his, his big wartime experience going into Berlin. I thought, you know, Jack, there's probably a lot more to his story that he didn't talk about and that we don't know. 
And so um, that got me to thinking. There's a lot of things Jack could have talked about. For example, the fact that the Confederate Navy numbered at its peak uh, just shy of about 6,000 souls. So think about that. It's tiny. Uh, compare that to the Union Navy. We're looking at uh, total enlistments during the war were 118,000. So let's compare the odds there, 118,000 to 6,000. Uh, if you think the Confederate Army uh, armies had trouble, imagine the Navy, really, really small by comparison, and the ship comparison is similarly small. Anyway, he could have talked about that. There was a bunch of stuff he could have talked about. So um, in digging around a little bit in his record and finding out more, it's a couple things that really come of interest, stuff that he didn't talk about it. And I tend to think the reason he maybe didn't discuss it is because these are maybe more painful, more personal parts of his wartime experience. And uh, the big one really happens at the beginning. Uh, Jack is a cadet at the U.S. Naval Academy. He had dreamed of being a sailor, dreamed of being in the Navy and having a career as a sailor. So he makes that big step. He goes to the U.S. Naval Academy. Of course, the shadows of war are gathering around the country at that point. And Jack is in the academy uh, looking forward to a career. And as he's uh, preparing to embark on that career, his home state, South Carolina, secedes. And he doesn't really talk about it. There's no record. But you know that he had to be really in a lot of pain as he came to grips with an awful decision. You know, we know of Robert E. Lee and how he famously had to make a difficult decision about what he wanted to do. Well, Jack Rimble here is probably no different. He had the same decision to make. His is far less known. But when South Carolina seceded, on December 20th of 1861, Jack, uh, who I'm sure had already been thinking about it, he made the difficult decision four days later on Christmas Eve of 1861. He resigned as a cadet. And so uh, a couple of days later, his hometown newspaper, the Charleston Courier, has some praise. It says, nothing, nothing less can be expected of true sons of the South. So they embrace Jack Rimble in his story. And um, Jack goes on to participate just a couple weeks later uh, in, he's, he's put into the garrison at Fort Moultrie, which has just been abandoned by Major Robert Anderson and his garrison of Union artillery. They've been moved over. You all know where they went, to Fort Sumter. Uh, so Jack and a garrison of Confederates move into Fort Moultrie. And in early January of 61, uh, President James Buchanan, he's biding his time. He's just holding on to do the best he can in his remaining couple of months in office. Uh, Buchanan sends a transport chugging, steaming along the Atlantic coast. It's called the Star of the West. The Star of the West is loaded with supplies. It's generally considered kind of a, a, a a humanitarian mission. And so uh, when that ship, the Star of the West, comes around by Charleston Harbor, uh, well, Fort Moultrie lets loose with some artillery, fires a bunch of shots, I believe the number 17, fires some shots at the Star of the West. Star of the West decides that they're not going to uh, try to confront anyone, so they take off and leave the scene. So here's Jack. Uh, in January 1861, who's involved in his first military action. Now, because we have the benefit of hindsight and we're beyond the stories of the Shenandoah and understanding his role at the end of the war, we can go back and think about the beginning of the war and think about January 1861, November of 1865. That puts him in the service of the Confederate States for just shy of five years. So think about that. Really, it's about four years and 10 months if you want to add it all up. So I think now that we can look back at this for a longer period of time, that you've got a man who has served for literally five years during hostilities. 
Now, I'm just touching on his early experience and his late war experience. There's a bunch of stuff that happens to him in the middle. And um, his story actually appeared in, uh, in a 2015 article in Military Images. So you can look that up if you want. Uh, or you can just wait because it's going to be on the Library of Congress's website along with this original photo, which is part of the Tom Lillenquist collection. So uh, sometime in the near future, look for his full story or go back into MI into the, I believe it's the autumn 2015 issue. <coughs> Excuse me. Moving on. Uh, speaking of interesting images, if you consider Jack Crimble, Crimble's image rather unusual because there just isn't that many Navy images, Confederate Navy images out there. Um, here's another one that, that caught my attention. And um, I can uh, show it to you uh, in part because it's mine. Uh, I got it recently. I rarely show images and some of you may not even know that I'm also a collector. Um, I've been since I was uh, a teenager. So uh, this is one, a new one to my collection. And um, what I like about it uh, the most is uh, take a close look at what he's wearing, his eyewear. This is what I would like to have for, uh, for Christmas. If you're out there shopping for um, some sunglasses, um, you've got these flip siders, double lenses. Um, he has only one lens activated right now. And if you look to the side, <coughs> if you look to the side, of those glasses, you'll see that second lens, and they would flip uh, uh, over to make a second lens and add uh, more protection to the eyes. So this is uh, pretty cool. You don't see uh, soldiers, you don't see civilians really that much from the wartime wearing spectacles, let alone sunglasses. So I thought this was a really interesting image and wanted to share it with you. I did, by the way, see a pair on Etsy for sale. Uh, the price was a little steep, but wow, they're really nice. So speaking of interesting images, I've got this one here. This image now has a little bit of sadness uh, attached to it. Um, about 15 years ago, I went out to uh, Merrillville, Indiana, I was, as I was working on my Confederate book. And um, I met with a gentleman named John Sickles, who I knew in name only. Uh, John was a uh, senior editor of Military Images Magazine, a prolific collector, known uh, universally as a gentleman, a very kind man, uh, and I can attest to that. Um, John, uh, when I contacted him by letter, he responded and said, uh, he welcomed me, said, come on out, um, you can spend time, uh, hang out in my home, look at my images, and um, scan anything you want for the book. So really, really wonderful. I'd never really met him in person before. I had seen him at some of the Civil War shows, um, but he invited me, literally a stranger. Uh, so I made the long drive to Indiana and um, had a pleasant day with he and his wife and his son looking at his photographs and talking about Civil War. He gave me his business card as I was leaving, and his business card has this photo on it. Uh, this image is now in the collection of Rick Brown. and. Um, I'm sorry to tell you, and some of you may have already learned this on Facebook, I posted uh, last week, that John passed away. Um, he was 73 years old, uh, had been suffering in ill health for a while. And um, I, John was a true um, uh, an honorable member of the uh, collecting fraternity, a member of the community, and um, will truly, truly be missed. It was with great sadness that I announced it on Facebook. And so if you're listening tonight, um, keep John's family in your thoughts and your prayers as we go into Thanksgiving. Uh, John, um, by the way, was mentioned no less than 399 times in military images. He was a prolific contributor. And um, 399 mentions, if you look them up um, in our digital archive. And so um, his 400th mention will happen in our next issue which is going to come out. Uh, it'll be going to the printer next week. And um, inside is a brief tribute to John. So um, uh, it was with great memories and um, great sadness that, uh, that to remember John. So um, thanks for listening in about that. Another individual that I want to uh, 
talk a little bit about tonight. This is very much alive. It's Mark Dunkelman. And uh, Mark has a new book out. It's called Gettysburg's Coster Avenue. It's by Gettysburg Publishing. Uh, my good friend Kevin Drake uh, is uh, the head honcho of Gettysburg Publishing. And um, they do fantastic work. Uh, the Gettysburg Atlas and a number of other books come to mind. Um, Gettysburg's Coster Avenue is the, uh, is the latest, one of the latest books to come out through Gettysburg Publishing. And um, it tells the story of Mark and his fascinating journey. Uh, and um, he's an interesting figure to me, not only because of his relationship with the 154th New York Infantry, which is uh, his descendants, um, or pardon me, his ancestors fought uh, with that regiment. Um, but uh, what really fascinates me is in 1970, when Mark was visiting Gettysburg, uh, he went over to the area where the brickyard fight occurred on the first day of the battle. Um, it was not, it was out of the way back in 1970. It was not a destination for uh, visitors to the battlefield. But the monument to the 154th New York was there and uh, Mark went over to visit and he noticed that behind the monument on private property, uh, a huge warehouse, I believe something like 80 feet long was being erected. Now that uh, building, some might consider it an eyesore. Uh, Mark certainly was disturbed that it would uh, do damage to the view of the monument. And uh, some folks, might have petitioned the company to remove it or petitioned the government to take it down or done something else uh, to try to stop it. Mark came up with a different solution. He decided to add rather than subtract. And what he did was he thought, you know what? I think a mural would actually look really cool on the side of this building. So he and a friend uh, over a period of years wound up painting a huge mural and some of you may have seen it it's been through two renovations and it's still there and um, i love the story because what mark did is really he brought something to life and uh, my favorite part of the story as mark tells it is when he goes back nowadays to visit the coster avenue site um, he sees people there he usually sees visitors where he never saw them before so mark added not only a beautiful mural, uh, a wonderful piece of art, but he also added something to uh, a better understanding of the battle. It's a tribute to, uh, as he says, New York soldiers and North Carolinians that fought there. So um, a tip of the cap, tip of the forge cap, if I had one on, to, um, to Mark, and congratulations to him on his new book. Um, I recommend a copy. I've got mine. I read it. It's great. Uh, so go to Gettysburg Publishing's website and pick up a copy for the holidays. I've got more. We're not done yet. Confederates in Michigan. It's a great image. If you're looking up close, you're going to see four letters down there. And I know that if you're a Confederate collector, you, you can probably tell me what those letters are. R E. E, S. I should say no more. This came with a note. The note's from Art O'Leary. Art's a longtime subscriber, super nice guy. And uh, he tells me this is a half plate ambrotite uh, by Mr. Reese that uh, um, as of a Confederate first lieutenant. We believe he's a cavalry officer because he has yellow trim. And um, it came out of an, a, Michigan, a Michigan estate sale. Now, uh, Art spoke with the person who owns the Im or owned the image uh, until it passed into Art's hand, and um, he learned a couple of things. And this is where maybe you can help. The person said that the man in the photograph is believed to be uh, a Colonel Hill, H I double L, uh, and that the person who owned it had ancestors who lived in Georgia and Texas. So the idea here is that if this is a Colonel Hill. He would have started out as a lieutenant, as indicated by the insignia he's wearing. So I'm going to post this uh, on our page so you can take a look at it. If you have any idea um, or can maybe ID or help uh, lead to a positive identification, that would be awesome. 
Here's another image that has its origins in the Confederacy, possibly. This one comes out of Statesville, North Carolina, um, from uh, Richard Anthony, um, contacted me about this. He's wanting some help identifying this image. Now, take a good look. I'll put this guy on Facebook, too. Um, he looks completely like a continental soldier, complete with a, uh, a, a hat, a cap down here sitting on the table. Um, the number is 76, definitely in a scripted uh, 1700s style with a plume, a fur plume on top. Um, the only, and he's got what appears to be sergeant stripes on a sleeve, but man, this guy is, looks completely continental. Uh, it dates from the 1850s, probably. And um, so I did a little bit of uh, looking around, contacted some folks, talked with our, uh, one of our senior editors, Ron Field, and um, Ron talked a little bit about the fact that uh, the 1850s was a really unique time uh, for the militia units. You had um, a lot of nostalgia going on for the Revolutionary War period. Um, you had activity around political parties, um, folks who were looking back in time, who were um, hearkening back to their roots. You certainly had some movements, the Know Nothings certainly is one of the best known political movements of that period. Um, so you also had this movement to try to um, copy the clothing in some of the local militia units. So Ron added, added a detail, which I thought was two details I thought was really quite interesting. Um, one of the, Ron says, uh, there were several books that were published in the 50s that were sort of, they almost were like guides. If you were uh, wanting to form a militia unit at the time and you wanted to dress in colonial garb, uh, there's a book by Benson J. Lossing, a name some of you may know. Um, he did a pictorial field book of the revolution was published in 1852 and um, it's basically a collection of engravings and descriptions of what the uniforms were like that the revolutionary war patriots wore fascinating stuff also uh let me take you to april of 1860 and uh, the daily dispatch which is one of the big newspapers in richmond virginia um uh, there's an article in that publication that describes in detail the uniforms of several corps of the Continental Army. So what we're all wondering, uh, Richard Anthony in particular, is um, was this guy uh, uh, in a, uh, a local unit that was around Statesville, North Carolina, that was inspired by perhaps uh, the Richmond Dispatch, or pardon me, the Daily Dispatch article was perhaps inspired by Lossing's book, or um, inspired by what was going on in that larger movement of looking back to the Revolutionary War. Or is it a Northern image? Uh, some of you may be familiar with um, a number of Northern continental inspired units. Uh, the best known one uh, was uh, led by former President Millard Fillmore. Um, anyway, uh, we're trying to get to the bottom of this mystery. So if you know anything about uh, militia companies from the area in North Carolina, Statesville in particular. We want to hear from you. We're going to post this image on the site and um, let you take a look. So a couple more images to show you. Uh, here's one that I think is uh, pretty interesting. Get it up here on the screen for you. By the way, you'll notice no technical problems this evening. <laughs> and this one's from Drew Bidwell. And uh, uh, Drew uh, has this to say. He believes that the man on the left, right here, is uh, John Dean, who served in Company D of the 8th U.S. Infantry. This would be one of his ancestors. Uh, I think that's great, and uh, we certainly would love to find out if it actually is him. This is believed to be him. We don't know for sure. Um, what I found quite interesting, I'm sorry, I pointed to the left, but I meant that left, sorry. <laughs> um, what I found interesting from a uniform detail is uh, uh, in addition to the, uh, the striped pants and everything that this gentleman is wearing, take a close look at his cravat. I'm gonna put this up really close for you. Um, he has his, uh, his regimental number eight is pinned to his cravat. I gotta tell you, 
I've never seen this before. This is a first where I've seen uh, the kind of uh, brass insignia that you would see attached to his forage cap is actually on his tie. So a really interesting detail. It's unique. I've never seen an image quite like it before. And so I'm certainly looking for other interesting uses of regimental uh, numbers and company letters. So if you've got something like that, I want to know. There could be uh, an interesting gallery there. All right. Last image for the night uh, comes with a request. Um, this image you all may have seen as part of the Lillenquist family collection on the Library of Congress. <coughs> Martin Callahan spotted this. And um, uh, here's a little bit of a backstory. Martin is actually looking for a particular uh, regiment. Here's what he says. He says, I'm trying to find a picture of an 11th New York cavalryman, it was also called the Scots 900, armed with a Burnside carbine. He's hopefully the, uh, the image is sharp enough to be able to really get the detail on that burn side. He's really interested in that unit. Uh, and he says, I know the 11th New York Cav was issued burn sides early in the war, and then they were replaced with Sharps carbines. And then at the end of the war, some of the companies were reissued burn sides. So uh, Martin is trying to find surviving images. And to date, he has not found any. So this image in the Library of Congress caught his attention simply because uh, there's a burn side involved, but he's looking for the real thing. So he goes on to note with a little bit of a humor. He says that you would think with 59,000 burn side card beans issued, there would be more images out there. Uh, and of course, he would like to find more images of the 11th New York Cavalry, and uh, he thinks maybe they're a little bit camera shy, or maybe they just hadn't surfaced yet. Uh, I'm sure it's uh, one of those unsolved mysteries. Um, I'm sure some of you have found the same thing to be true. There are some regiments that are particularly well represented by portrait photography and others that are not. So I'm going to post this image and Martin's contact information on our Facebook page if you can help him uh, and, or any of the other folks who uh, sent in images to be on this program. Uh, I'd love it, and they would too. So uh, with this, I'm going to leave you for the evening. Uh, before I go, uh, I do want to mention again our Black Friday special. Um, I also want to mention uh, the fact that Civil War Faces Marketplace, uh, Doug York, has been advertising. Uh, they're also going to be having a uh, Black Friday event starting bright and early. Uh, so um, go over to uh, Doug's uh, Facebook page on Friday morning. Uh, I suspect there's going to be some dealing going on there. And um, I do want to wish all of you a very happy Thanksgiving. Wish you and your families all the best. And thank you so much for tuning in. Have a great night. Take care. Bye.